Tonight I'm in a very unique situation. Just as you have not seen the material before class, I have not either. And um, it's when when you're preparing for when you're preparing for uh, being away. Uh, sometimes you miss something. I had prepared two weeks from now's lesson, but unfortunately I did not prepare tonight's. And it is good that we actually have word here on this uh, on here. I do have some notes. You don't have them, but I do. Uh, we are in Matthew chapter 25 uh, this evening. Uh, it's our second last parable uh, that we're going to look at. Uh, we, it is the parable of the ten virgins. And the background of this parable actually is found in the previous chapter. Uh, if, you re if you recall uh, from studying the book of Matthew, the entire book, or the entire chapter of uh, Matthew chapter 24 is dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming. Uh, and so Jesus had prophesied in Matthew chapter 24, if we go back there, in verses 1 and 2, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus says, See not all, uh, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be uh, left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And we do know that this prophecy came to pass. Came to pass. Uh, about 35 to 40 years later, it would, it would come to pass. 70 AD, the Jews rebelled against the Roman Empire, and the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. Why do you suppose, God, uh, like as far as we, we can sort of speculate maybe, but why would God have Jesus prophesy that the destruction of Jerusalem was going to happen with a necessary thing that was going to happen? Think about, think about Jesus. He was going to set up Christianity. A kingdom on earth. A spiritual kingdom. A spiritual kingdom. It, he wanted people from Israel to convert, to become Christians. When we have this competing temple, this competing religion, sitting alongside it, I do believe this is God. God's prophecy was, had a purpose. It wasn't just, ju just as God's prophecies in the Old Testament we're bringing us to Christ. This prophecy here was taking us away from the old covenant. Without the temple, the Jews would not be able to offer their sacrifices. Their genealogies would be wiped out. They would not have Levitical priests. It may, there's, yes, Judaism exists today, but not in the form of the Old Testament. Not, not in its true Old Testament form. And I believe that's God's providence, uh, making sure that that happens. Yes. And the Jews, just as the disciples who were shown in this temple, gloried in the temple and gloried in the law of Moses that stood behind it and had no intention of changing. It was a case of worshiping the law in the temple instead of worshiping God at the temple. Yeah, and uh, if you remember, like as far as Jesus was saying, that God wants us to worship him, not worship any man-made thing. Uh, remember in the Old Testament, the, the, the staff that, uh, that God told Moses to make, that they, the, the brazen serpent, uh, they began worshiping that after, after a period of time. Well, the temple was told to be rebuilt, and Herod the Great made it so grand, and they gloried in that temple. And that had become a replacement, in one sense, for God. And if we want to get the immediate context, let's go down to verse 42. Of 20, chapter 24 of Matthew. And we'll read 42 through 51. Uh, and so why don't we start with Mom at the front. We'll read uh, three verses each through verse 51. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due, in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat the 
his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at a, an hour that he is not aware of. And will cut him in pieces and assign him a place of the hypocrite, and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. So, if you were to summarize what we have just read in one or two words, what would they be? Be prepared. All right, so that's two words. Be prepared. Watch. Watch. Well, same thing. Be prepared. Watch. That is the whole context of this, and that will bring us to chapter 25, which is, if you recall, if you remember, man put these chapters and verses in. It makes it easier for us to find the different things rather than having a scroll and we have to find the different parts on the scroll or the parchments or whatever. Chapters and verses make it easy. But if chapters and verses also, if we're not careful, take the context away of whatever is under discussion. And so if you, if you have a red letter Bible, you will notice it's read all the way to the end, and it's read right until the beginning. There's no then Jesus said, or after this Jesus said. No, it continues right on through. So, waiting and watching is the idea for this parable. So let's read verses 1 to 13. Bill, why don't you get the first two verses, and then we'll read three verses each through verse 13. Um, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, who took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish, and five were wise. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took the oil in with them. But the wise who took oil the in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, the hour they all slumbered and slept. But at midday there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come to me, out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and for you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Yeah. I just wanted to ask a question. Bill, what version do you have? Uh, I have one or two. No, no, what well, version? The American Standard? Okay, I'm just curious. Well, I just watch versions of curiosity, and I'm not using my Bible, not I'm using the new King James Bible. You read there were uh, five foolish and five wise. The new King James says there were five wise and five, <laughs> within five foolish. Oh, really? I just, I just noticed things like wow. that. Wow, well, okay, I hadn't noticed that. Uh, all right, in this parable, what is... We have the kingdom of heaven is like. It's a parable. It's a comparison. What is the kingdom of heaven like this time? Ten birds. Uh, uh, so we've had the kingdom of heaven is like a net. The kingdom of heaven is like, uh, uh, like as far as uh, different types of ground. Like as far as all of these, the kingdom of heaven is like. And for our second to last parable, it's like ten virgins who took their lamps uh, and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And this is in one sense not so dissimilar to the one you had last week in the sense of here is a feast that people will be coming to or waiting for. Only in this case, they're not going to be called. They're going to be, they're waiting for the, for the bridegroom to come. Yeah. And so, uh, like, yeah, uh, we were discussing the wedding feast last week, and last week they were invited. Uh, this time they were already waiting. So it, in, in some instances, that happens today, too, at a reception, at a feast. Uh, and so a lot of the times, the bride and the groom are the last to arrive. 
and they, you're already waiting for them there. But these times they were waiting outside. Uh, they didn't have, they didn't have any. They took lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five were wise and five were foolish. Why were the what? What made the five of them wise and five of them foolish? One of them was prepared. They just be lamp, took out oil with them for the lamps and the others didn't. Okay, that's that's the only difference really between five the the two sets of five. Five of them were prepared. They knew that the bridegroom could be delayed. The bridegroom may have said, I'm going to be there at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, whatever it is. But something delays them. So these five wives were prepared for any delay. And the other five said, well, if he's going to be there at 5, we'll have enough for 5. And then we're going to go inside. And they didn't bring any answer. All 10 were expected to be at the wedding party. Yes. But they didn't know when the wedding party was coming. But all ten were expected to be there. Wasn't five were going to be slipping in the door. No. They were all expected to be there, but they were not ready to endure. No. And that's exactly right. The bridegroom delayed. Ten virgins slept till midnight. That's a pretty late time, we think, for the uh, the bridegroom to come. Uh, midnight. Uh, it's the middle of the night. Uh, and. They were told to go out and meet him. The virgins all went, trimmed their lamps. And trimming the lamps means that basically you turn them on. Uh, you, you're not going to burn at full, like you have oil lamps, you're not going to burn them full bright uh, all night. You might dim them, but you're only going to burn them as long as you have oil. And the five foolish, so they needed more oil. So what did they do? They wanted the wise ones to give them some oil. They wanted the wise ones to give them some oil. That's often that's often what happens. You see people. One set of people come prepared. One set of people don't come prepared. Well, can we borrow from you? You, you came prepared. And what was the answer? Well, we, we came prepared, but we won't have enough if we lend some to you. So in other words, they were prepared, but... Again, you, you, you can't prepare to, like, if, you, if you went to a meal, and like as far as you can't, you can prepare for extra, but there's only so much extra you can have. And they were prepared, but they could not spare oil for these five foolish. So what did the five foolish uh, virgins go do? They were told to go buy it. They told to go buy it. They have to have oil. They can't. It's the middle of the night. So they have to go buy it. What happens, uh, as always is the case, what happens when they leave? Bridegroom comes. Bridegroom comes. They went into the feast and they shut the door. Uh, the feast began. You, they weren't going, there weren't going to be stragglers coming in. It, it's, not, it's not one of these parties that you just, you just come in whenever you please. No. If, if uh, the wedding feast starts, Whenever it starts, it starts, and if you're not there, well, you're not there. You're not getting in. Uh, you're not getting in late. So the later the five foolish virgins come, and they knock on the door. Lord, let us in. Let us in. What was the Lord's response? I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know you. Jesus summarizes in verse 13, says, Watch, therefore. For you do not know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man comes. Remember, chapter 24 deals with two things. The destruction of the temple and the return of Jesus Christ. People get confused as to, because Jesus was back and forth, back and forth in, in Matthew 24. But they didn't know when the temple was going to be destroyed. And they, don't, they didn't know when Jesus was coming again. And therefore, just like this bridegroom, they didn't know when he was coming. They needed to be prepared when he did come because when he came, if you weren't there and you weren't prepared, you weren't getting in. And that, uh, that is his point about the, the, the coming of the Son of Man. We don't know when he's coming. We need to be prepared. Bill, you have a comment. I know you, you often thought remind everyone about not being in the presence of God, but the eternity, what that's like the idea of it, just thinking when the virgins came, 
couldn't get in the door, they might have been expecting some something else to hear. Like maybe be told, well, you, you weren't here, you weren't ready. They, they were simply told, I don't know. Yeah. That's pretty shocking. Yeah. Kind of reaction. It, it is. And it's the same reaction we get in Matthew 7. Yeah. Uh, about not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven, but they who do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And people will say, well, Lord, Lord, we've done many great things in your in your name. We've cast out demons. We've, worked, we've done many wonder, uh, wonderful works. Not in our name. If we are not, if we are not following God, it's like he never knew us. He won't associate with people in sin as far as he won't accept that. And it's as if they were never known. And yes. yet in this parable, they were expected to be of that wedding feast. Mm -hmm. But they weren't going to be because of their own action. Yeah. But in other words, they were expected to be there. They had we would have said a right to be there. They have them who were invited to be there. But then they didn't meet the qualifications. Yeah, they, they didn't. They weren't prepared. They weren't watching. And it, it goes to show you that when we're told to do something and we count on delaying, we, like they went to buy oil and they probably said, well, he hasn't come yet, so let's just quickly go do it. And we get back here and no one will ever know. Well, okay. we need to be prepared. Oh. I was just going to say, when you look at, when you compare it, okay, say your life as a Christian, and you start out, and those ten of them started out, they all had lamps, and they all had some oil, but some of them didn't have enough. Just like some people can live their lives, and all their lives they can uh, do what they should be doing, and and think they're doing fine. But then towards the end of their life, maybe it just sort of falls off. And so it's they like they endure. never were. Yeah, they don't endure. And, and, and it's exactly it's exactly true, though, when Titus 3 says, it's not because of the work that we have done, but God's mercy and God's grace that saves us. We can't buy our way into heaven. We can't live three quarters of a life of a Christian or three quarters of our life as a Christian if we don't end up as a Christian. It's not going to matter fire it's mixing metaphors a little bit but we are the light of the world a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hidden but if there's a power failure the light is hid i guess that's, that's something new anyway let's get to our applications for our lessons first lesson that we have is that jesus here is the bridegroom and he's coming again for we too to build the kingdom. And we're built John 14 verses 1 to 3. John 14 verses 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I come again and will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now this specific chapter and the two that follow it are addressed to the apostles. He is trying to comfort the apostles. He is about to die. And his apostles aren't quite understanding what's going to happen. And they, he said, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in me. Believe in you, you believe in God. You believe in me. So I'm in my Father's house, which is heaven. There are mo many rooms. In other words, it's big enough. Uh, we, we sometimes think of mansions as these big houses. That, that's just a picture to tell us it's big enough. It, it's it's not this tiny cottage on the uh, uh, on the on the brook. It's big enough. And he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going now, and I'm preparing a place. And if I go and prepare a place, I'm returning to receive you. Now he is physically talking to his disciples here, but we learn that over our, over uh, their shoulder that he's not just it's not just the apostles that are going to be in heaven, that it's going to be the righteous, 
But just as Jesus is coming to reward the righteous, the flip side is true as well. Um, uh, Henry, you want to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. He comes in that day to be glorified in, in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among those who believe. Okay, so there's two sides here in 2 Thessalonians. Jesus is going to come, it's the same time. He's going to come and going to punish the wicked. Those who never believed in God and those who believed in God and stopped. Two sets. And they're going to be punished with everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord. But it's not, Jesus, Paul here is saying, it's not all that. Jesus is also coming to be glorified in his saints. There are, the, there are going to be righteous here, and they are going to receive that inheritance. So the first lesson that we do get from this parable is Jesus is coming. We just don't know when second lesson that we're getting to is the virgins are those who have been expecting his coming and are invited to the wedding feast but not all will accept and not all will prepare so the virgins are the ones who have been expecting his coming all of them were invited but not all of them prepared properly let's go mom to Acts chapter 2 you can get 38 to 41 and dad can get Colossians 1 21 to 23 so Acts chapter 2, verses 38 to 41. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Okay, this verse we quoted a lot. This is preparing. This is preparation. We cannot be in the kingdom without first walking through the door. We have to walk in. We can't stand outside looking in. If the door has been opened to us, we need to walk through it. But not just anyone can walk through it. Anyone could. But only the prepared are going to literally walk through. Peter said, repent and be baptized. Now they believed in verse 37 before that. Repent and be baptized. That's what you need to do to prepare. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. For the promise. Promise of eternal life. Is not only for you. Not only for your children. But all those who are afar off. As many as the Lord our God shall call. And that's what three, about 3,000 people did. They began preparing. Now if we read further on in the chapter. They remained prepared. They didn't stop. Baptism is not the end. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of a, of a life in Christ. We have been raised to walk in the midst of life. We must continue walking in that life. Colossians chapter 1. Um, where did it go? 21 to 23. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath, has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast 
and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. You were once under, what was the word you had? Pardon? What was the word you had in verse 21? And you were sometimes alienated. alienated. It was the same word, okay. What does that mean, alienated? And then it makes sense. What is alienated? Separated. Separated. Uh, like as far as alienated is separated and enemies they were enemies to God by wicked works now though through the blood of Christ through Jesus' death we have been reconciled what is that? brought together brought together it's the opposite of alien been brought back together now we have been brought back together through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ the obedient are have their sins remitted. But notice what verse 23 says. If you continue. In other words, what follows, what follows is conditional. Heaven is conditional on us remaining faithful. We can't remain faithful without following the scriptures. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But it is us who must remain faithful. We can walk away. A lot of the times Calvinists, they try to teach from the book of John that the devil can't snatch us out of God's hand, that nobody can take us away from God. But what they fail to realize is we can walk away. The devil can't make us walk away from God. No one else can make us and physically take us away from God. But we can walk away ourselves. And we need to continue in the faith, grounded and settled, not moved from the, the hope of the gospel, which you have heard. They had obeyed it already. We should not move. So in other words, the virgins are expecting his coming, and they're prepared. That's the lesson number two. Any comments before we move on? Well, lesson number three, the lesson of the oil, teaches us teaches us, sorry, at the judgment we will not share with the works of others but we will each be judged according to what we have done. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 is 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Okay. Everyone's included in that verse. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, when we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, how are we judged? Individually. Individually. I don't get to ride in on the coattails of somebody else. A lot of the times when you're in business, uh, children of the big wigs, they often can ride in on the coattails of their parents or of someone in the know can't do that. We are going to stand on our own. Now that could be a good thing if we have evil friends and, and evil parents. Or that could be a bad thing if we were the evil person and everyone else we knew was good. As far as righteous before God. It's a double-edged sword, but we're going to be judged based on our works. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, we're going to be judged. Bill, do you want to get Revelation chapter 20 uh, verses uh, 12 to 15? Okay, we're going to take a pretend for a second. This is uh, not, we're not done. 
Um, this is the book of your life. Everything you've ever done, written in the book. There's not one thing you have not thought, you have not done, not written in the book. And that's the picture we're getting here, is that we're going to be judged based on what's written in the book. Are we going to be judged? Uh, are we going to be found righteous before God? Or are we not going to be found righteous before God? It's going to be based on what's written in the book. Based on what we've done according to their works. Now again, these aren't works of righteousness that earn us salvation. They are works though that God has foreordained, preordained that we should walk in. Ephesians 2 verse 10. We must never come along and say, I, ha I have nothing to do. We have things to do. God's grace will save us, but we can only receive that grace through faith. So that's the lesson of the oil. We will not ride in on the coattails of anybody else. Next lesson. The bridegroom's arrival was a surprise, and so will be the second coming. There will be a lot of people surprised in that day because it's been almost 2,000 years. It's a little bit shy of 2,000 years. How long about did it take from Abraham to Christ? We've been studying this. Uh, Bill should know the answer. About how long? We're not looking from Abraham to Christ. Generations. There is generations. I think we studied before almost about 2,000 years. Uh, if you take a look at Abraham being around. Moses was around 1450. You go back 400 more years, and you get 1800. Oh, almost 2,000 years, if we accept 1450. Now, of course, as we've said before, dates are dates. And we don't rely on dates that far back. But almost 2,000 years. God made his promise to Abraham, but he fulfilled it. It took time. God, Jesus promised that he would come again, but he didn't tell us the time. Just like Abraham didn't know the exact time when God would fulfill his promise, he knew it was going to be sometime in the future, and he had faith that God was faithful to do that. He never saw it. So is this coming of the Son of Man. We have been promised this, but we don't know when it's going to be. Henry, do you want to get 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10? As a day of the Lord will come as a seed in the night, in which the heaven will pass away with the great noise, and the elements will have learned to eat the work of the feet, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Okay, the day of the Lord, second coming. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Who here is planning on being robbed tonight? We weren't planning on being hit tonight. Uh, but who, who's planning on being robbed tonight? I don't see any hands in the audience. We don't plan on being robbed. When are we robbed? Bill and Tammy have been robbed. When were you robbed? When you weren't expecting it. If you were expecting it, you would have been there. You would have had the cops there. And no, we don't expect to be robbed. That's how the day of the Lord's going to be. It's going to come as a thief in the night. We're not expecting it. We're, we're, we have other plans. Uh, we, we keep saying, well, tomorrow I'm going to do this. Well, perhaps tomorrow we will. Uh, but we don't know. Perhaps the Lord will come again before that. I'm planning on traveling to Florida tomorrow. But perhaps I won't. Perhaps something else will happen in between. Day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Heavens will pass away like that. Great noise. The elements will melt with fervent, fervent heat. And I was saying, I think I said on Sunday or in a previous lesson, I know I have elements. We think of diamond. Diamond's a very hard piece of carbon. If you, don't, if you want to know, same thing that's uh, in your pencil lead is also in diamond. It's the same thing. Just rearrange the atoms a little, a little differently and you get the same thing. It's no different. Absolutely chemically the same. But diamond requires a lot of heat to damage that. If you want to melt what that is requires a lot of heat. All the elements on this earth all melt at different temperatures, but this is going to say the elements melt with fervent heat. 
they're going to melt. Everything is going to go away. Everything on this earth, the pyramids, the, all, all of the great buildings we've made, all of the great technology that we have, is going to go away. All going to be burned up. The point is it's going to happen. You have something to say? Or no? That's our fourth lesson. We have two more. <clears throat> Fifth lesson. And we've already talked about it, really. Pete, the ten virgins, or the five virgins who weren't watching, went out to buy oil. They came back and saw that the doors were closed. Now, they were expecting the bridegroom, <coughs> but they weren't prepared. Found the doors closed. What did they say? They said, Lord, Lord, let us in, let us in. Well, the Lord said no. We're going to get some verses on this. Mom, if you get uh, Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23, and Dad can get Mark 16, 16. Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you, apart from me, you workers of lawlessness. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave almost this entire thing except for the middle verse in this parable. They came on what they say, Lord, Lord. They expected to get in. They expected, ah, oh, Joe, Sally, well, I guess it, these were ten women, but uh, Sally and, and uh, I don't know, Josephine. Josephine, oh, there you go. Uh, they, they were expecting, oh, we know you. We'll open the door up for them. And, uh, and open the door, come in, come in. We know you. They weren't expecting the answer they got. They, I never knew you. I never knew you. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into heaven. There's a lot of people in that condition today, sadly. They think they're a Christian. Why do they think they're a Christian? They've been told they're. They've been told. You're a Christian. People are told every day, all you have to do to become a Christian is believe. Say, Lord, Lord. Basically, Lord, come into my heart. Save my soul. I am a sinner. And say, basically saying, Lord, Lord. Not, not in that exact phrase, but basically the same thing. You're just calling on Jesus to save you. And I admit, if the Bible taught that, that's what we preach. If, if Paul had said, all you have to do is believe, that's what we preach. I have nothing against that doctrine, if it's found in the Bible, but the fact of the matter is it's not. It's not there. And so people are, are deceived into thinking, all I have to do is believe. Belief is important, but so just as important as repentance and acknowledging that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and confession and baptism for the remission of sins. It's just as important. One of those things by themselves doesn't save us. But all of them put together provides God's grace. And so these, these five virgins received an answer they were not expecting. And sad to say, there will be many people on the judgment day receiving a similar answer. You did not do the works of my Father. You didn't do the will of my Father. Jesus said in another place, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines and the commandments of that's what a lot of people do today. They teach the commandments of men and, they, and equate them to the doctrines of Christ. We cannot do that. We have to worship God in spirit and in truth. We must go to the scriptures. We find it in the scriptures, let's do it. If we don't, let's go. That's our lesson. Lord, Lord, will not get us into heaven, just saying. And the final lesson will bring us back to the beginning. The whole lesson of this parable is watch. Be ready for Jesus' second coming. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. Oh, I, for, I forgot you, Dad, with Mark 16. We'll give you 1 Thessalonians instead. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5 to 11. Why don't you get 5 to 8 and 10? We can get 9 to 11. You can, you can 
you get that. Those first one, one, one. Five versus five to eight for you and ten to nine. You are all the sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ die for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Okay. Here he's saying, don't sleep, as others do. People, they sleep in the night. People, it used to be people who get drunk are drunk in the night. It's not always true today. Uh, people get drunk whenever they feel like it now, but generally speaking, most dangerous time to travel on the road is in the middle of the night because there are drunks out there. And those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who are drunk, are drunk at night. We aren't to be people of the night like that. We are to be sober. We are to be people of the day. We are to be, we are to put on the breastplate of faith and love, a helmet, and the hope for a helmet, and uh, the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Because God has appointed not us, not us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation. But we have to watch. We mustn't fall asleep. We mustn't get drunk to, uh, that would take our mind off. Now, this is not just saying don't get drunk. I, I do teach you. The Bible doesn't teach us that we're to drink. But the whole point is drunkenness takes your mind off of whatever it is you're doing. It takes your mind away. We are all... We are all children of light and children of the day. We must not be of the night and be of darkness. We must watch. The Christian finds hope in the coming of Christ. A lot of people dread it. The Christian should find hope. Our final verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Bill, why don't you get that? But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Must be sore with others who have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the comfort of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Thessalonians were worried about something. They were worried about the dead. The dead who were in Christ. They were expecting the coming of the Lord to happen very soon. And they said, well, what about the dead who died in Christ? What about them? They said, they didn't die without hope. They had hope. Don't worry about them. They're safe. They will rise again, too. They will receive their reward, just as those who are alive. Those who are dead will rise first. Those who are alive here on this earth will rise to meet them in the air. And will be changed just like that. That is the parable of the ten virgins. The context of the parable of the Lord willing two weeks from now is the same context, the parable of the talents. And that will be our final parable in this series. And hopefully then, I know I have the, the material for that. I'll give you the material for the ten virgins uh, then too. Uh, it'll just be, uh, I'll have to prepare it first. Uh, but... We must remember, as we study tonight, we have made a decision to follow Christ. Our decision to follow Christ began when we first believed, when we repented of our sins, when we confessed Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and when we were baptized for the remission of our sins. That was our decision. But as we are, as we were reminded tonight, we must not forget our decision. Let's not take our decision and say, well, I have 
done that, and therefore, I don't have anything more to do. We have decided to follow Jesus. There is, should be no turning back.